Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of eStewards version 4.1, where we will be providing an overview of the changes between version 4.0 and 4.1 and talk about some of the transition requirements that are relevant to currently certified eStewards clients. My name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Program Manager with PJR. Welcome. I have a brief agenda on this first slide. We'll talk a little bit about uh, PJR, who we are, what we do. We'll cover at a very high level some of the benefits of certification. However, the emphasis on of today's webinar will be on the transition details and the key changes because again, we're working off the assumption that most of the clients reviewing the webinar are currently certified clients who will be transitioning rather than new clients pursuing initial certification. We'll close with time for questions, so feel free to type those into the question field at any time throughout the presentation, but I will be saving those for the end. And a little bit of housekeeping too before we uh, get started. Today's presentation is being recorded and a uh, you can download a copy from PJR's website. Once that is uploaded, you can also access a copy of the slides from PJR's website if you'd like to download them for future reference. Perry Johnson Registrars is one of the leading registrars in the world. Registrar is another word for certification body. A few country, this list is representative of some of the countries in which we have certified clients. Um, while it's not an all-inclusive list, it certainly gives an idea of our global presence as a certification body. PJR is accredited to grant certification to a wide variety of standards, and of course, today we are talking about eStewards. Benefits of certification to a standard such as eStewards vary by organization, but typically the most common is that commitment to the prevention of irresponsible or illegal handling of those waste streams, ensuring that the data security is maintained, that social responsibility is upheld, and that environmental conservation efforts are adhered to as well. Certification can drive improvements to EHS or environmental occupational health and safety performance. <clears throat> there can be improvements to other business management strategies, including public image. The ability to advertise the certification is value added for a number of organizations as well in terms of providing a, a competitive advantage. The standard represents the framework for maintaining compliance with both customer and regulatory requirements as applicable. A little bit about version 4.1. 4. Version 4.1 of the eSteward standard was published earlier this year, specifically February 22nd. I've included some links if you do go ahead and download a copy of the slides. However, they're available right on eStewards website where you can download a copy of the revised standard. Um, you can also download what I've hyperlinked here, a version of the standard specifically with the changes highlighted to draw your attention to those key areas where, in which revisions were made. You can also obtain copies from the eStewards website of the sanctioned interpretations. That's in two parts, parts A and B. Essentially, they go into a little bit more detail as to the, the changes themselves. So some of the background information, some additional explanation of the nature or reasoning behind the changes made. Subsequent to publishing the revised version of the standard, eStewards also published their transition plan. So that was released March 14th, and you can find a copy of the transition plan on eStewards website as well. The eStewards transition plan details that any audits scheduled between 
this is a period that has now passed, but the audits scheduled between uh, the publication and April 22nd could be conducted to either version of the standard. Now that that deadline has passed, all eStewards audits are required by that transition plan to be conducted to version 4.1. So you will need to transition at your audit taking place on or after April 23rd. What this means is that existing clients have to have implemented the new sanctioned interpretations, those changes in the standard um, by the time they have their transition audit. If your audit is scheduled to take place soon after the deadline, it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to make those changes, but let's say your next audit is not until later this year or even early next year, you've got quite a bit more time to get those changes implemented. The transition audits are able to be completed virtually if your system is a good candidate for virtual audits. Some clients have been having virtual audits for the last couple of years with the pandemic. Others have been able to facilitate on-site audits. The transition audit can potentially be virtual. Transitions take place during surveillance audits or recertification audits. It depends on where in your, <clears throat> excuse me, your audit cycle you are in when uh, this next audit takes place. So again, if you're due later this year, if you're due in the near future, and that's going to be your transition audit because all of those audits after April 22nd need to be to the new version of the standard. <clears throat> now, if you're due for a surveillance audit, PGR may add time to the audit to, to cover the transition requirements since we are required during that first audit to version 4.1 to cover all of the changes. There's an overall deadline specified in the transition plan as well. All clients or all certificates need to be transitioned by April 22nd of 2023. Any remaining version 4.0 certificates will be withdrawn. PJR recommends a transition audit take place by February 1st of next year to prevent a lapse in certification with that deadline. That means that the activities that take place after the audit concludes, such as the technical audit package review, closure of NCRs, all of those things need to be completed before a certificate can be issued to version 4.1. And we wanna make sure the audit isn't happening too close to that deadline to facilitate uh, a timely resolution. Otherwise, there will be a period of time in which you're not certified to e-stewards at all. Getting into the key changes in the standard, we're gonna cover these at a high level. One of the main changes in version 4.1 is the acceptance of RIOS certification as an alternative to ISO 14001 certification, which was previously the only accepted alternative. So the prerequisite has always been ISO 14001. To be eSteward certified, you needed ISO 14001 certification. Now you have the choice between ISO 14001 and RIO certification. So one of the key changes in version 4.1 is the addition of that verbiage wherever we're talking about the prerequisite certification requirements for eStewards version 4.1. We see revisions to the definition of an eStewards processor to clarify that control extends even to electronic equipment not subjected to processing. The definition of problematic components or materials, also known as PCMs, was also revised specifically to remove PVCs, which is considered an HEW and already listed in the Basel Convention, so it was found to be redundant. There's a new definition for a processing facility to include mobile processing, sampling, applicability to multi-sites, and the impact on requirements relevant to eStewards organizations as far as how long they have to achieve certification and which sites are required to achieve certification for the other sites to maintain certification. 
There's clarification in 6.1.3.1 regarding transboundary movements of waste. Since e-stewards can't dictate to other countries' governments how they handle waste, if a country or nation does not require, does not consider a specific waste to be hazardous or to be a controlled waste, e-stewards can't impose that can, uh, prior informed consent process on those countries. So the verbiage there is clarified. <clears throat> there are revisions to and additions made to the performance verification program requirements, and those are found in 6.1.4. The language regarding rechargeable batteries destined for reuse has been revised. You can find that in 8.5.1b, and this is to align with a revised definition of the term repurposing. It's not significantly changed, but if your organization is handling rechargeable batteries and doing testing for that, you'll definitely want to take a look at section 8.5, excuse me, 8.5.1b. There's also a new section, 8.5.1b3, that allows for the direct reuse of batteries without testing in very specific instances. So again, if batteries are relevant to your organization for for reuse purposes, take a look at these changes. As I mentioned, we see some changes as far as the definition of repurposing. That's why that term is capitalized here. There's a new section in version 4.1. You can find that in 8.5.1.1, and this focuses on repurposing, both in alignment with the revised definition and to clarify what types of repurposing can constitute direct reuse or could be an acceptable form of direct reuse. And you wanna make sure you're utilizing this information in conjunction with the functionality and transparency requirements of the eSteward standard. <clears throat> 8.5.2 contains clarification regarding QSCs that will ultimately be tested by an IDP. There's a lot of acronyms in e-stewards in case you're not already aware. <clears throat> Clarification is also found in 8.6.1a regarding the expected evidence of a conditionally allowable option to demonstrate approval provided by the e-stewards administrator. So what would constitute approval before you go ahead and implement that conditionally allowable option that you have you, your organization may have petitioned to be able to utilize? If that is relevant to your organization, if you are utilizing or hope to utilize a conditionally allowable processing option, definitely take a look at that one. The criteria in 8.8.2.1 and 8.8.2.3 have been revised to ensure non-e-stewards downstream processors maintain the criteria necessary to process and or dispose the MOCs for the subsequent tiers. And this includes the removal of the requirements for all downstream processors in the recycling chain to have closure plans. That is just for IDPs. There's additional verbiage in section 8.9 regarding data security expectations, NAID AAA certification transitions, et cetera. In part, this is to clarify the requirement for e-stewards organizations to protect that personal data when it is received, even if the upstream or the customer claims it's already been sanitized. The exception to this would be instances where the customer actually maintains ownership throughout processing and you may be limited in the scope of processing for which you are contracted or approved. I mentioned <clears throat> earlier in the presentation, the sanctioned interpretations are in two parts, A and B. 
you'll notice when you review them, sanctioned interpretation A focuses primarily on the body of the standard or the main text, including the definitions, uh, without really getting into the appendices very much. There are instances where they overlap, so I don't want to say exclusively uh, it does not include the appendices, but the focus of interpretation A is the main body of the standard. Sanctioned interpretation B, on the other hand, focuses more on the appendices, again, except for where they overlap and not exclusively. I did want to note, too, that the majority of the changes in sanctioned interpretation B, I noticed focus on those revisions I mentioned earlier, allowing for Rios to be accepted in lieu of ISO 14001 uh, for a client organization to choose their preference. So the majority of the changes in interpretation B focus on that change. Again, that impacts a, a number of the requirements or verbiage uh, throughout the standard. <clears throat> so at a very high level, those are the key changes. <clears throat> you can download a copy of the slides, as I mentioned, or save a recording of the presentation to get those clause numbers to take a closer look at, depending on whether they are relevant to your organization. And again, those sanctioned interpretations also go through the standard, identifying the changes and walking you through some of the background or clarifying what that change uh, represents. You can also utilize that highlighted version of the standard that draws your attention to the changes made. I covered them at a high level because this, the changes are not significant for the majority of clients, I would say. <clears throat> So again, the assumption was made that the majority of folks attending the webinar are current clients looking to transition. However, if we do happen to have clients interested in learning more about eStewards, I have included a brief summary of what that registration process looks like. So if you're a new client pursuing certification to eStewards for the first time, it will be to version 4.1 since we are no longer allowed to conduct audits to version 4.0. And the first steps in achieving certification or registration would include obtaining a copy of the standard, establishing your system's documentation to meet the standard requirements, conducting any training required by the standard, implementing the standards requirements, inclusive of an internal audit, a compliance evaluation, and a system review or a management review. You'll need a contract with a certification body, such as PJR, to conduct your audits. The audits will con include a Stage 1 and a Stage 2 audit, which I'll explain on the next slide. And you'll need to resolve any resulting nonconformities before a certificate can be issued. Again, I mentioned the Stage 1 and Stage 2 audits. The Stage 1 audit is primarily a documentation review to ensure the framework for meeting the standard requirements is in place. The Stage 2 audit is a full system audit to assess the effectiveness of the implementation of the standard requirements. Are you following your documented processes and are you effectively meeting the standard requirements? It samples all of the processes, all of the shifts, really gets a clear picture and a robust sampling. Again, any nonconformities need to be resolved before a certificate can be issued. Once a certificate is issued, which is good for three years, you fall into the surveillance audit cycle. The following two years will con consist of <clears throat> surveillance audits, not usually as long as a stage two audit, not necessarily sampling all of the processes every year, we'll sample between the two. The third year in the cycle is the recertification audit, very similar to a stage two audit in that we cover all of the processes, all of the shifts to again, conduct a more robust sampling before a certificate is issued and the three year cycle begins again. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and type your questions into the chat field and I'm going to put my contact information on the screen in case you have any questions to discuss offline. Again, my name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Program Manager with PJR. I can be contacted 
by phone, although to be honest, I prefer email. <clears throat> and I've also included the sales department phone number in case you are a prospective client looking for a quote about eStewards or adding eStewards to your current certifications. Let's see what, if any questions we have that I can answer. No questions yet, I'll hang out for another moment. But in case none come through, again, the presentation's being recorded for you to download from PGR's website, as will a copy of the slides be available. If you have your transition audit coming up, definitely take a look at those sanctioned interpretations, the revised version of the standard. I hope this high-level overview is helpful. Feel free to tune back in for future webinars on this subject. We'll continue to keep the slides updated as we conduct more audits to version 4.1 and share any helpful information with you that we can. Still not showing any questions, so thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a great day and that the content was helpful. Thanks.